Hey, uh, so um, any question before we get started here? Um, are there any questions over some of the stuff we talked about yesterday or Friday? Sheridan, did you get a, a chance to watch through um, the last few minutes of lecture? Okay, cool. So, um, as far as what's left to be done, um, the main thing we need to finish up is the actual um, shopping cart screen. So we left it yesterday. We kind of gotten it started. Um, you will notice if I say go back and try to add something to the cart again, you'll notice every time I try to add something, that's the only thing that appears in the cart. So, you know, that's one of the things that we need to address is make sure that the shopping cart can kind of keeps track and remembers of what you've added to it. So that's one part of what we want to do today. Um, and the other part is just cleaning up a little bit of the navigation things um, so that you're going to the right place. So, for instance, you can see if I hit the up arrow from here, it's always taking me back to main activity. And I prefer it to actually take me back to whatever screen I was on previously. Um, we'll also notice if I go through either the um, the menu button here or the FAB, that that takes me to the order screen and not the, the cart screen. Um, so those are the kind of things we need to fix is, is finishing up the shopping cart as well as um, fixing some of the navigation um, bits. Um, are we going to, I can't remember if we did this, but for the shopping cart, are we going to work on um, like setting it so that when you change the quantity, it updates mm -hmm. the price on that change? Is that yes. something that we're going to do? Okay. Yeah, that's one of the things we need to do. Correct. And so like in the, in terms of the shopping cart, um, get in here, we want it to also show the, you know, the totals down here, which is what it's not doing. Right. And we also want to do like, okay, I select three. It should change that number and should change down here. Yeah. So that's that's part of the the part of the mix of things we need to do today. Okay. So um, I think the first thing to bite off really is to just start with these buttons um, back on main activity and kind of fix that navigation real quick um, before we go any further. Um, so what I'm going to do on terms of the the main activity. I'm going to pull up um, activity main. And I'm actually just going to, because we have it already in the menu, um, I'm actually just going to remove the FAB because I, you know, it's really redundant to have two ways to do the same thing. Um, plus, well, if I can get it selected, I may have to go to the component tree to actually select it. Um, there, I want to delete the FAB. Um, Plus, it's really not an action, right? So, so going to the cart is not really modifying the cart. Um, it's actually just navigating to another screen. Um, so, to, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but um, what's the little tip and trick that you do whenever it says like whenever it shows the gray screen and like the actual name of your item? Like mine says Android X Recycler View. What did you hit to make it? If it does that, then you just tell it to run the application and wait for it to go. Um, that's just a process, a matter of it hasn't finished building. So it should go away if you just tell it to run the app or just give it some time. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, so FABs are generally not, generally supposed to be things that are action, not navigation. 
um, is the purpose of them. So we want to kind of keep that, keep that true to form. Uh, so that's why I'm removing the FAB because it's a, a navigation button. Um, the menu makes more sense as something that we would use for navigation. So I'm not going to have the, I'm not going to have a FAB here. I'll just have the shopping cart there. Okay, so let's go fix where this points. So if I open up the main activity class, here we've got, you know, you'll notice we have a bunch of methods here on donut, on sandwich, on froyo, on order. You know, there's there's a lot of stuff there that we're not really using anymore. Um, because, well, first of all, we replaced the, the UI here with the recycler view. And secondly, because, well, we're about to change how this works in terms of going to the order. So we can really ditch all of those four methods here. So on donut, on sandwich, on froyo, on order. I'm going to comment all, those, all that code out because we won't need it. Um, and so what I want to do then in, in the on option item selected, which is what happens when you click that icon, is I'm going to say, let's actually go to the, um, let's go to the cart screen. So intent equals new intent. This and it's going to go to cart activity class. And then I'm just going to say start activity with that intent. Now, commonly you'll run into the cases where you say you're using switch statements like this. And you'll say, well, multiple of these need to go to different screens. Um, so, for instance, I might have an intent here in this case and an intent in the other screen. Um, you'll notice that there's kind of a, a red underline on that. Does everybody see that? So, in this case, it's saying, well, you have the, the intent variable basically declared twice. Um, because all of this code within the switch is, is kind of in the same context. Uh, so you can't redeclare the variable. Um, so commonly things I do if I need to declare the local variables within the code uh, is I just put, say, a, a curly brace around it, around the particular case. Um, and that creates a, another additional scope just by putting those curly braces, which means that that's not a problem. So, so a lot of times, if I do need to declare variables in there, like an intent, I do find it helpful to go quickly and put that in curly braces. That's just a little tip and trick there that you may run into. Okay. Questions? Are we doing that for all of these cases? I'm just going to change that for this one case. Oftentimes, I would go ahead and change that for all the cases, but I'm just going to change that for the one case here in question. So if you have that right, the FAB should be gone. And when you click the shopping cart on main activity, it should bring you here with an empty shopping cart. So the next question is, so I want to get the shopping cart to kind of stay, to remember what you've added to it, okay? So, you know, given the options that we have right now, what, what ways do we kind of have to, to pass data around from one activity to another? Okay, so we have intents. Do we have anything else? Do we have any other options? The data source. Okay, the data source. 
And the problem is the data source doesn't really give us a way to pass things around because we're just creating it, say, in here in main activity. I'm creating it. So let me show you something real quick. And you don't need a copy of this code because I'm just doing this for demonstration purposes. Um, in the, and I'm about to pull it back out, in the product detail activity, um, let's say I want to, when you click on add to cart, we're going to maybe pass the cart through here. So maybe I say uh, internal to this, I say private cart cart. So product detail has a cart. Again, don't follow along with this because I'm about to remove all this code here. Um, so if I say, let's, let's take that cart and we pass it along, pass it around from this screen to another. Um, put extra cart, cart. Oh, um, I do need to mark that as serializable so that I can pass it around. So I'm going to pass the cart as a variable and then receive it over in the cart activity. And so rather than saying uh, right over here when we've got we're reading stuff, I'm going to say cart. Actually just cart because I want to use the, the instance variable is equal to cart so the real reason i'm doing this i just want to illustrate a point in terms of one of the things that you run into with passing things through in intents so i'm going to go to the donut and I'm going to click here. It's going to send. Now what happened there? Oh, because I need also mark the cart items as serializable. So one thing to know with, with serializable, um, in order for, like, for instance, cart to be serializable, everything within it needs to be serializable. Um, so the floats are all good. Um, the array list actually implements the serializable interface, um, which you can see here. Um, but the items are not serializable. So I get, right now I'm getting an error when I try to serialize the cart because those are not serializable. So in order to pass those things around, both the cart and the cart item would need to be serializable. Can you code this in? No, you don't need to code this in right now. Yeah. So I'm just doing this for illustration purposes. It's probably good to mark the cart item and the cart as serializable, but, but, um, I'm just showing what happens. Oh, and I'm still getting an error. What did I get this time? So on create card activity. On a null object. So I called it cart here. Oh, I never actually constructed a cart. Duh. Okay. So let's say I go here, I'm passing the cart through, I go back, and I pass the cart through again. I, oh, that's not what I want to do. I want to go put the cart in there. Get this back arrow because we haven't fixed the up arrow. And then do that again. You'll notice that second time, even though I'm passing the cart back and forth and I'm using it, that it doesn't change, right? There's not two things there. So one of the one of the things that happens if when anytime I serialize something, um, serializing um, is the is is gonna take that object and turn it into um, turn it into basically a string of bytes, um, a series, uh, an array of bytes. And then when I come back over to card activity, I'm deserializing that here, which means I take that string of bytes, that array of bytes and turn it back in 
to an object. Okay. Now the problem when I when I deserialize it, I'm creating a new instance. Is everybody with me? When I deserialize it, I have a new instance. I don't have the same instance that was originally there, which means that any changes I make to this card don't affect anywhere else in the app. Does that make sense? Everybody with me there? Yeah. yeah. So because those are different instances, um, oftentimes passing objects around in terms of uh, in terms of intents oftentimes is not what you want. Um, in addition, just to the fact that you're passing around a lot more data than you need to. Um, so I'm going to roll some of these. I'm going to roll these changes back that I did. To get is using the serializable is that expensive? Um, no, it's actually it's it's there's a cost to it, um, but it's not big enough to be noticeable here. Really, um, there is a cost that could cause some lag if you have. Let's say I'm taking the whole array of products. Let's say I've got a million products, and if I was to serialize that, I would see some lag going from screen one to screen two. But if I'm just serializing a single product or a cart, uh, I'm probably okay. Um, unless, of course, things like, what if that product actually includes the images? What if it includes the actual drawable object, which all the image data? Well, that image could be pretty large, and that means that serializing can be expensive, okay? So in order to really make this shopping cart work, we can't use any of the tools that we've learned. We can't use intents to pass the data around. Is everybody kind of with me there? It's not possible. Um, so um, it, and it's not just a case of it's it's not hard. It's hard. It's it's just not. It's not something we can do um, because it doesn't work. So um, we need a way to pass data from one screen to another that is kind of separate from that process. Um, so one way that we we sometimes do that is you could say, well, it's serializable, we'll save it to a file and then read that file on the other screen. Um, or we can use the, the settings API, which we'll talk about in, in um, lesson nine, where you, you kind of, again, save it to a file and then load it back up. Or you can use a database, which is basically a shared file. So you put it in the database and then load it back up on the other screen. All of those, you're basically put it in a file, load it up, up on the other side. Um, downside of any of those approaches is obviously you're reading and writing files and that that's slow, right? And you'll actually notice if you're doing that, you'll notice some lag. If you have to read and write a file or have to read and write to the database in order to transfer that data. Um, so we want to transfer that data in memory, not using files. Everybody with me so far? Something other than serializing. Yeah. Okay. So um, I have kind of mentioned this before um, briefly. Um, but in Android, there's this idea of the application class. Um, and the application actually persists. It's created when your application starts, and it doesn't go away until your application is shut down. The nice thing about it is it is a very good storage place for any data or other things that you need to be available throughout multiple mm -hmm. screens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take advantage of that application and put my data there. And that way, multiple screens will be able to access and, and work with that application, and it won't go away as I change screens. Everybody with me there? So I'm going to put it in a place that's not in an activity is, my, is the, basically the magic to this. So first thing to do is I'm going to create a new class. Um, in Android Studio, unlike activities, there's not a quick convenient method for this where you can just say create a new application. Um, you have to actually create a class and kind of do the work 
um, like you would if you were to say make an activity from scratch where I have to make the class and I'm also going to have to hook it up in the manifest. Um, so I'm going to create a new class here. I'm going to call it Droid Cafe. Uh, we're still not following along, right? No. Now you want to follow along. Sorry. This is where you want to follow along. The previous, the previous bit there was just, hey, here's, here's what you could try to do. It's not going to work, right? You could try to pass the card object around. So this you want to follow along with. All good? So Droid Cafe class. Okay. So I'm going to create that. Uh, this needs to extend the application class, so the Android app application class. And then in here, I can have whatever fields I need. And I can set those all up with my onCreate method. So I can say onCreate, override that, do whatever logic I need here when the application starts. Now question, I've got this class, you know, this application class. What folder do I put it in? Right now, just kind of put it out there, not inside of any of the three folders that we've created. Where should I put it? Mm -hmm. This is true. Okay, so that's that's one option. Um, another option is is I could potentially, if I was going to pick one of the three folders that exist, um, I would probably put it into model um, because that's what it's most closely related to is going to be our model classes. Um, so if you are going to pick it, pick putting it into one of those folders, that's where I would put it. But yeah, I would say outside is is probably best. I could create another folder, call it application, um, but that application folder would only ever have this single class in it. Um, I'm not going to put, um, for, for any app you have, you can only have one application class. Okay, um, so we've got this Droid Cafe. Um, now it's worth doing a real quick check just to see when this occurs. So I might want to say, let's log it. Um, it's worth noting because of where this happens in the events, um, you typically don't want to show toasts or can't show toasts from this application class um, because it, the UI hasn't been created yet. Your activities don't exist yet. So I can't use um, I can't use my um, Toast here, but I can use log messages. So Droid Cafe. And if you're going to, you know, as you're going to do stuff with this application class, I would strongly recommend that you always put a log message in here um, so that you can see if it actually got created. Okay. So, because if I look at it right now, and I try to look for Logcat and go back to debug, search for Droid Cafe. I'm not going to find that message. Okay. I'm not going to find that message because right now, Android doesn't know about this application class and it's not running any of the code in it. Everybody with me there? It wouldn't be in debug anyway because it's an I, log.i. Um, I is a step above info. Uh, it, it, info is a step above debug. So remember, it's it's that level or above. So debug is is debug or higher. Info is info or higher. Warning, etc. So you can see the order of, yeah. of where they land. So I need to have this actual class hooked up. Um, and so the thing you have to remember anytime you're making a application subclass is you can't just create the class and, and be done with it. Um, you have to remember to register it in the manifest. So back in the ant manifest, you can kind of see with each of the activities, you see how there's this Android name property, which links it up to the class. 
Um, and you'll remember if you don't have this in here, then you get all sorts of errors. Um, it's the same issue with the application. So in here, we need to say Android name. And so, you know, definitely take a note of this. Um, this textbook does not talk about the application class at all, even though it's a very, very important thing to understand and use. Um, but that's one of the things you have to remember to do, is you have to remember to set the Android name in the manifest. Because if you don't, well, nothing's going to happen. Okay. You won't have this application class being used. That's it. Yep. It's just you have to say the Android name. And so if we run it now, there we go. You can see how it says application created. Um, so that's one of the reasons that I would always recommend you log the fact that it's created so that you can go back and check. It's like, okay, did that code actually get run? Um, because if it doesn't get run, you're going to run into bugs much later on in the, the process, and it won't necessarily be obvious. Okay? Any questions so far? So now that we've got Droid Cafe created, this class created, and we've got it registered, um, I want to actually put some logic in here or some, some data. So in terms of fields here, I'm going to add private product data source. Because it actually would be good to be able to get to that from anywhere in the application and have a shared instance of that. So I want to have that there, and cart's kind of the same story. Okay, so I'm going to add two fields for that, and then inside of on create, I want to construct that. Um, it's worth noting that you really should not, let's say, do this. Don't do that because it will get created at the wrong time in the life cycle. Um, so this code, if you put it here, this will get run before OnCrate has a chance to actually run, before Android's really ready for you to do anything. Um, so I would strongly recommend against putting any sort of constructors or function calls up here when you're declaring the variables. Just declare them. Don't initialize them yet. That's not just here. That's general advice, not just here. Yes. So uh, in terms of products, I'm going to say products is equal to new product data source. And I'm also going to create the cart here in on create. So what this means is both of those two things will get created when the application starts. I can then use those um, in the application where I basically where I need them. Um, in order to actually be able to reference them, though, I do need some getters. So, for instance, in here, I am going to get have a getter for get uh, get products, and I also want a getter for get cart. That's my entire application class for today. Um, you know, this is this is something that will grow over time, and there's more things that we'll want to add as we go along, um, especially later as we hit chapters nine and on, um, lessons nine and on. But this is this is just the starting point here. So. If you, for instance, had you know multiple database tables, multiple different kinds of entities, um, that's where I would store. You know, basically, this is your source of truth for the data. Okay, so if I understand right, the purpose of doing this is an alternative to doing the serializable. Um, it's. 
in some sense, it's an alternative. And in another sense, it actually behaves very different. So if I'm going to serialize things, I actually have to do that serialization process and then deserialize it. Um, and I have to do that work. So by doing this, I, I get around needing to serialize in the first place. Everybody with me there? So I'm just going to use this as the central repository for my data so that I don't have to serialize. Or use an intent. Um, I still have to use intent. There's no way for me to get around intent. I'm just going to change the data that I pass around. OK, so let's think about um, the different activities that we have and, and how they're going to connect up with this. Um, before I go too much further, though, can everybody check your um, log and check that you're seeing the, the text application created when it starts? Yeah. because I'd rather troubleshoot those those problems now before we go any further. So if you could thumbs up that post if you're if you're seeing it, that would be great. The Droid Cafe then it gets around the need to serialize and that's it. We still need the intent. Yeah, we still need an intent. Which makes the application run more smoothly. Zach, are you having a problem? No, I got it. I just, I put a caterpillar because it's the first stage before it gets complicated. <laughs> yeah, I believe me, this is like this first part. I had so many students last semester that on the hands-on test forgot to do that. And actually in multiple hands-on tests forgot to put it in the manifest. Uh, so, you know, make it yourself a really big note to do that and put a log message because um, otherwise you get later and it's like, well, what's going on? Well, I missed that one tiny little line and I'm not going to help you with that on the hands-on test, suffice it to say. So. <laughs> All right. So next thing. Um, now that we've got that data, we're going to go through the different activities and use that application class. So in terms of main activity, I'm going to go into on create here. Right now, every time we create main activity, every time on create gets called, we're creating a new data source. Um, that's a problem because that means we're also losing any data that we potentially had put in there or modified previously. So I want to use that data source um, from the application instead of constructing a new one as we see here. So, so rather than writing it this way, and I can also get rid of order items because we're not going to be using that anymore. Um, so instead of creating the product, the, the product list that way, I'm going to say, First of all, we want the application. So our application class is Droid Cafe. App is equal to, now there's a method on every activity called get application. Guess what it returns? It returns your application object. Now, um, it specifically returns though, you'll notice there's an error um, because it returns application or that based class. It doesn't return our specific subclass. Everybody with me there? It doesn't return our subclass. So I need to actually cast it to what I need it to be. So I'm going to do a cast. We're going to cast this to Droid Cafe because that's what I know that I have. I will tell you immediately if you didn't get the thing in the manifest right, this this line right here will error out. And it will say, an app, your application is not a subclass of Droid Cafe, if you miss that one thing in the manifest. 
Um, so I've got my app, and now I can say uh, product data source is equal to app dot get products. So we're basically I'm replacing this one line where I'm constructing a new data source with those two lines where I'm using the one from the I'm retrieving the one from the application. Okay. Any questions? Uh, well, my my app is showing up in red now. Okay. Did you cast it? Uh, pro possibly not. Okay. So notice I have these little parentheses where I'm doing a cast. So I'm yeah. saying yes. I, the, you you think this is an application, but I know better. It's actually a Droid Cafe. And so if we run that, that should, oh, I need to go to on save instant state and fix that real quick. So in on save instant state, remember we've removed the order items, uh, which actually means I don't need to do anything here. My on save and my on restore are actually going to be empty because there's nothing to save and restore. Because it's saved in the the uh, application. Yeah, because the our application is taking care of you know having a centralized place for that data. So so more and more as we do this, the importance of save and restore the state are diminished. Um, yeah, they're going to be diminished a little bit. Um, the save and restore is still for data that's actually on the screen you're looking at. Okay, so. Yes, it's going to be diminished. It will be less important than it has been, um, but it's still something to consider. If there's, you know, data you there's data you still need to save if it's maybe specific to that screen and not global. Um, so there are still cases for it, but it's going to be less common. Okay. So if if all of that's running, all that's good. I should be able to go ahead and run the application, and it should still should be showing my my products okay um so in a similar fashion i'm gonna go let's say now that i've got that um, i can get around the serialization when i want to say go look at an activity um, so in here remember product list adapter product list adapter when you click on it you see how we're sending the entire product as an object. Everybody see that? So, so given this change, I don't need to send the entire product. I just need to send the ID of the product. So I'm going to change this to product ID. And this is going to be item.getID. So again, this is in the product listed after class. We're going to be sending the ID instead. So that's going to the ID is going to go from here to the next screen where we view the product. Okay. Everybody, everybody got that? Make sure you change it to product ID. Um, let's now go over to the uh, product detail activity. And so in product detail activity, we're now going to be receiving not the entire product, but just the ID of that product. Okay. So I'm going to change my code here a little bit. You see around line 42. So rather than receiving an entire product object there, I want to say, well, first we're just going to get the, the product ID. So string product ID is equal to intent dot get extra, get string extra. And we're going to ask for the product ID. Okay. Now that I have the product ID, I can use that to go back and refer to um, the product within the product within the data source. Okay. Now you may remember 
in order to get that data source, remember I needed to have a reference to the application object. So what was that? What was what was that that I needed to write just a moment ago to get the application object? Was it the parentheses droid cafe? Um, that's not the whole line of code. That's part of it. Droid app. Mm-hmm. Parentheses droid cafe. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm trying to go from memory. Let's yep. uh, get Let's start application. Yep, that's correct. Get application. It's worth remembering that because this is going to appear in several, if not all, of our activities at this point. Okay, so we need to get the application, and then from there we can get the the pro the specific product. So I can say product now is equal to app dot get products dot get by ID. Remember we implemented that get by ID method um, on Friday. So I can pass in the product ID as such. That comes from the extra. There we go. If I've played my cards correctly, then we should have the product stuff. But this time we aren't sending the entire data about the product from one screen to another. We're just sending the ID. All good? Questions? Are you starting to see how the application fits in? Maybe a little bit. So um, that's what I'm going to do there. Is anybody still typing on that before I go to the next thing? Nope. Okay. So next place to be would be the actual cart activity. And this is where we're going to actually start seeing stuff happen. So in here, I'm going to say, let's go get the app, Droid Cafe app. Again, that's equal to Droid Cafe, get application. And then from here, I'm not going to construct a new cart. I'm going to say app.getCart. And if you make that change, this is where we're going to see the thing that we're actually trying to get to. So we're going to see, if I go in here, there's a donut. I can go back and add an ice cream sandwich. And they're both there now. because we're not constructing a cart every time we visit the cart activity anymore. We're creating one when the application starts and then reusing that object, modifying that object as we go. Any questions? Now, notice if I add a donut again, notice that I now have two donuts on there. It's not quantity two, there's two donuts. Why is that? We're not checking what's in the card already. Okay, it's not checking what's in the card already. Where should we do that check? There's at least two options. Is it in one of the adapters? Um, not the adapter. I'll say that for sure. Where do we actually add the product to the cart? Uh, 
uh, looking and seeing it, uh, line 48. Okay. So line 48. All right. So that's one answer. Is that all the code for adding the product to a cart? Notice that calls add item, right? So I could put the fix either here in add item itself, or I could put it in cart activity, right? I could fix it either one of those two places to make sure that we don't get the same product in there twice. What would be the benefits of, say, you know, is there a reason I might want to fix it in the activity rather than the cart class? I don't think there's any reason to do it that way. I would do it in the the logic, the business logic of cart, because you're always going to have that same situation. Every cart will more or less behave the same way. Mm -hmm. So, so you're right. So again, putting that in, why would I do it in the cart? You kind of flip the question around. Why might it be better to do it in the cart rather than doing it in this activity? The uh, card activity, I see it more as of a view mm -hmm. rather than the logic. Okay, there's some truth to that. What happens if this application grows and I have more than one screen where you can add it to your cart? Like, what if I wanted to say, let's go back to main activity. What if you long press the item, long pressing it adds it to the cart, right? Well, if I put it in the activity, I have to write that code twice. Everybody with me there? The, the problem with writing your code into the activity is you're going to potentially have to write the code multiple times if you need to do the same thing on multiple screens. So it's good as we we're talking about, yes, it's business logic. So the business logic you want to extract from your activity. The other benefit there, remember we talked about unit tests right if i put the code here i can't unit test that if i put it here in in card activity i can't unit test that but i can test it and see that it's working if i put it here everybody with me there following yep so let's think about what we need to do so what we want to say is if it's already in the cart then we're going to update um, that item. Um, otherwise, we're otherwise we're going to add it. So, if the if it's already there, we're going to update the the quantity of the of the item. Otherwise, we're going to add it as a new thing to the cart. Now, uh, one option I have, I have an update item method already, right? And I could potentially use that, right? Because that, that has all the logic we need, right? So I could try to duplicate that logic or I could try to use this method, okay? Now, let me ask you, is there any way for me to know from calling this method whether or not it did anything? Does this update item tell me whether or not there was a product in there? with that ID. It really doesn't tell me anything, right? It, it just goes and does its thing and doesn't report back. So oftentimes we may need to report back and say, you know, was there a product there to update or was there not? Um, so one of the things I would do is maybe change this to a bool, boolean, and say, well, if we found the item and we updated it, let's return true. Otherwise, if we didn't find anything to update, product's not there, let's return false. Does everybody follow me there? So it's going to return true if it was updated. And return false otherwise. Can you see where that might be helpful? 
Yeah, it's definitely a time saver. Yeah. So what I can do now that I've got that, I can just say, well, if let's try to update the item. Given the item dot product ID and given item dot quantity. Actually, this is not going to work. I'm going to say right ahead of time because I know what the problem was. Um, let's say I try to do this. Say update item, item, get product ID. Actually, this is backwards. I need to say if it wasn't updated, if there, if we didn't find it, it got down here. If it's false, then I want to update it. Um, the problem there is what am I updating it to? Well, I'm updating the quantity to one. So if I add a donut once, and then I go back and add the donut again, okay, it blocked it from getting in there twice, but it didn't actually update the quantity correctly. Because what I need to actually do is increment the quantity. I need to not set the, I don't need to set the quantity, I need to increment. Is everybody with me there? So I they look very close. And I was thinking in my head, it's like, well, I can probably reuse that code. Then I can't because I need to actually change. Um, I need to increment the quantity. I need to add to the quantity rather than here. We're, we're just saying let's set the quantity to that. Okay, so let me let me roll back here. Pull that if statement out. So, okay, well, if I'm gonna have to write the code that's gonna be correct for this case, um, I probably need to start with a loop. So let's say, let's loop through the items. So for int i is equal to zero, i is less than items dot size plus plus i and so as i go through each of the items i'm going to go grab the item so i'm going to say card item item equals item so i get item so save the item as we go through and then if if we found it which turns out to be the same check here because I'm looking for it. So if I found it and it's the same product ID, which maybe, maybe I want to save the product ID, but that's fine. Oh, um, I have a problem in that this is called item. Let's change that. I'm going to call this new item. So we've got new item and item here. So item.getProductID equals new item get product ID. So if the IDs match up, then we know that we need to update it. And so there I'm going to say item set quantity is the item current quantity plus the new item dot get quantity. So it's the sum of those two. And then otherwise, if, you know, basically if I get all the way down to the end and I haven't found it, that's where I'm going to need to then say, well, let's add it to the list. So here I might say um, Boolean found is false. If we find it, we're going to set found to true. And we can stop the loop by breaking. And then finally, once we finish up, here I'm going to say, if it wasn't found, that's where I need to actually add it. So if not found, then add the item. And finally, this just needs to be new item instead.
to quote. Any questions here? Um, if you kind of look at CART, you'll see that I'm using an algorithm several times. Several of these methods use a similar algorithm. Like this one's doing a for loop, looking for something with the same product ID. This one's doing a for loop, looking for something with the same product ID. This one's doing a for loop, looking for something with the same product ID. Do you remember what we call that algorithm? We've learned that name in second semester. Okay, what kind of search? It's two names that goes by. So this is what we call either a, a your, your C-sharp book called it a sequential search. Typically we call it a linear search because you're just going linearly through the list of items one by one and and looking at them and seeing if they're the the thing you're looking for um, second semester you might have also learned potentially about binary search um, but binary search only works if you have a sorted list which we don't have here So you'll keep seeing this linear search come up all the time. You know, it's a very good algorithm to remember and get used to because um, you're going to see it with all sorts of things. Okay. Anybody still typing? Still working on this add item method? I've got a problem with the emulator. I okay. forgot my device today. Okay. It's got a black screen. Um, what that's all about. But, um, yeah. I don't have an emulator. I don't know. That's the oh, okay. I just closed it. It's a black screen. Okay. I just hit the power button. Oh. Yeah. That's just okay, so we've got things being added to the cart and it, it remembers that so I can, you know, navigate around and, and add another add another product. So that's that's a really good step forward. Right. So I can add things to the cart. Um, what I'm still missing is I'm still missing logic for showing the, the totals and the tax. Um, and I'm still missing logic that responds to, say, changing the quantity or clicking the, the trash can. So I still need to put those things in place. OK. Um, so let's think about the um, maybe the totals first, right? How can I get it to show the totals? On the add item, can you append like the, the text for total? Um, where do you mean? In here? I'm talking about in the add item method? Yeah, like like you have the total value, you have the subtotal uh -huh. tax amount. You just okay. put it into the nope. text. Remember that the cart has no connection to the UI and shouldn't, right? As soon as you put logic in here that's dealing with text, you are breaking your separation of concerns. Okay, so this class should have no knowledge of the text that's on screen. Okay. So that, that logic actually belongs back over in, in card activity. So back over in card activity, you saw that we kind of started setting this up. Um, we we went ahead and, and added it to the cart. 
Um, I updated, I created the adapter and, and set that up as far as the recycler view, but I didn't initialize the, the views for the totals. So here I want to say maybe subtotal view dot set text. And here we want to use the, the subtotal for the cart. So string. Um, Although actually I want currency, so this is going to be currency. So let's say, do I have a currency formula already? I do not. So number format, currency format, is equal to number format dot get currency instance. Again, I'm going to say this as locale US. So that it comes up as US dollars. Um, and so my currency format I'm going to use here to say, well, let's let's format out the um, subtotal. So that would be cart dot get subtotal. And I can do the same thing with the tax and the total. So Text view dot set text, and here I want my currency format dot format, and I want cart dot uh, get tax amount. My total set text. Currency format dot format, and this would be cart dot get total. So that should take each of those three values and format them as text. Okay, so I have progress. I like that text. Huh? Mm-hmm. You're noticing something. Okay, so there's two bugs here. A, yes. There's the no tax applied either. Huh? The the tax? Where's the tax? You're very muffled. No, I'm not sure what you're saying. Where's the the tax? The tax. So there's no tax. Okay, that's a problem. How do I know what numbers those are? I'm missing my labels too. Okay, so let's fix the the label question first. How do I fix that? Okay. So maybe maybe prefix prefix it in here. So I could say like subtotal plus that. Maybe subtotal colon plus that. That'd be the best way for uh, translations. This would not be the best way for translations. Be the work. This would not. This would not be how you'd want to do it for translations. Oh, I meant like when you put in the string.xml and you convert it. My bad. Yeah. So. So if I have it that way, okay. So I have the subtotal. I've got the tax. I've got those. Uh, let's look at real quick what happens if I extract these. Um. I'm going to do all enter on this string and say extract this resource. This is going to be uh, cart subtotal. Oh, watch out. That's on your tax resource. Oh, oops. Well, I'll have to go fix that. It's not too hard. So under res. I'm going to go to strings. Uh, yeah, so there it says cart 
subtotal is tax. So I'm just going to rename it here as cart tax. And I'm going to go back to here and change it to cart tax. So I didn't fix that problem solved. Okay. Now, one of the things I want to do, if I am just have it written this way, which looks like it's got some extra parentheses in there that I don't need. Um, I would like this actually to give me the flexibility of putting the, um, the number before the label or after the label, right? So with this format, though, I can't do that, right? Do you see that? I can't do that if I format it this way. So what I'd actually like it to be is I'd like to put a percent s there so I can fill in the number where I want it to be. And that way mm -hmm. I want to say, you know, if I wanted the tax in the beginning, I just put the the percent up here, percent s. If I want it after, I put it there. Wouldn't you do a dollar sign like point two float float thing? So it's like a float. I could. I could. Um, except that I'm using this currency formatter, which the currency oh, formatter yeah, yeah, yeah. and turns it into a string. Okay. Um, so I could put that in as like the 0.2f, you know, 0.2f if I was feeding it in as a float. I'd also have to add in like the dollar sign, which would be two dollar signs because I've got to escape it. Um, I could do it that way. The problem is that wouldn't necessarily scale to if I ever wanted to have different currencies. So I'm going to have it there as percent %s so I can use the, the currency format if later I de decide I need to have it in a different currency. Does that follow? Because those are two separate concerns. So that's going to be my cart tax. And duplicate that. So we're going to have the cart subtotal, cart tax, and the cart total as my resources. Is everybody tracking with me there? So do you now want to have those ending? Never mind. Never mind. I was seeing the wrong thing. Oh, what were you seeing? Um, I had a um, an, a backslash and then some mm -hmm. quotes surrounding my stuff, and it shouldn't be. Yeah, I had that show up there initially for me too, and no, I don't want that. So those are my strings. I'm gonna then go use them back here. So I want to say. get string and so we're going to say get string or dot string dot uh, cart subtotal comma the currency format and so that's the way I want it to be and and you'll notice that it's a little bit different than the way it Put it in automatically when I extracted it because I really didn't know that I wanted to um, potentially do a placeholder. So that's what the, the code ends up looking like. And to be honest, is there too much hepping on that line of code? Yes, probably. Um, because if we look at the number of functions that are being called, you can see set text, you can see get string, you can see currency format dot format, you can also see get subtotal. So there's there's four functions being called on that single line. And and usually I try to keep that much lower than you know four function calls in one line. For obviously, for obvious readability reasons. So, what I might do 
to try and make this more readable as I might take at least part of it and break it out. And, and the part that I think makes the most sense to, to split out is the, the currency format part. So here I might say string subtotal amount or just subtotal is equal to that string uh, tax is equal to currency format all that and string total is equal to this because then I can just sub that in and have a lot less code to work look at as far as what's happening in that single line. I'm going to go ahead and post that in the Discord just because it's easy to make some mistakes if you're reading the watching the stream. So just a quick question on total, it is supposed to be get tax amount also. Oh, no. That's a goof on my part. No, it shouldn't be. Good catch. Okay, so that's that's how I would resolve the formatting. So I'm using a combination of the currency formatter to format currencies in addition to using the um, the string formatting tools in terms of string resources. Probably, I don't know if it helps to readability, but it probably does to split those up. Okay, so the next question is, why is the tax zero? Why is it always zero? Right, so we never set it. Um, so, you know, there's there's maybe a few different way, places that we could choose to set it. Um, the place I would go set it is I would go back to Droid Cafe and set it here after we've created the cart. So I might say in the Droid Cafe, let's say cart dot set tax percent, um, and maybe we set it to eight percent, or zero point zero eight. So that should give me a nice eight percent tax. It also means now if I ever need to change the tax, you know, basically right now I, I just have one place to change it. Or I could potentially change it when you have when you get to the the cart screen or whatever. Change it based on your zip code.
Okay. What what remains on this screen? What have we not done yet? What's still not working? Uh, updating the price based on when they change the quantity. Okay. From so the like if I spinner. if I go to three, that should update. Correct. Okay. The um, what? Delete functionality as well. The delete functionality as well. So where can I where can I put that code to handle when the spinner's changed? What has access to that spinner? We would do it in the card activity and then call remove item. Okay, so in the card activity, you're saying, are you talking about the the delete button? Yeah, yeah we would tap into the delete button. So let's think about the, the card activity. Um, does the card have activity have any way to get to that delete button? Or does it have in any way to get to the spinner? Because it's actually both the same problem. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. So who owns who owns the those things? Well, it's the the individual items or the individual view holders, right? Um, so really, if we're going to respond to those, we have to do it over in the adapter. Does that make sense? Yes, it would make more. It would be better if we could do this in the um, in the activity. But right now, we only have a way. We only have access to it within the adapter. So if I go into card adapter, um, let's say we go in here. I've already hooked up a, a non-click listener for when you click the button. I could click up another listener here for when you change the quantity. Quantity view dot set on item selected listener. I think that's the one I want. So on item selected listener, we're going to say let's create a new view dot on item. Oh, it's adapter view on item selected listener. Okay. So if you pick a new item, then we want to update things okay so first of all if not if if you select something we can get the position and so I remember that the quantity would be um, the position minus one since we're starting at one is the first number in the drop-down and so I just need to um, potentially change potentially um, change that but I'm going to go ahead and just say let's let's do a toast report just to see that it's working so toast make checks context this is quantity colon plus quantity the variable and toast dot length short dot show. Okay, so let's say we have that. So if I change the quantity, okay, we can see that that is triggering. 
Now, it doesn't look like I'm getting the correct quantity. Because so, it seems like I always get 3. Or no, there I get. But we don't want the position, right? It's the whatever it happens to be in that label. What were you saying? In line 67, we're getting position minus one. You don't, don't you want what is entered in there? Like, let's say it was a string. Mm -hmm. Corey, you were trying to say something? Well, it looks like the like it's already getting minus one. So when we say minus one, we're getting like minus two. Because um, okay. like when you get five, the pop up is three. So let's see if I just spit out the position. That doesn't pop anything out. Okay, so I get one when I pick that. See? So we... Oh, yeah, that's probably what I'm missing. I'm subtracting on that anyway. So, two. Oh, no, that gives me... It's because you're adding it in the plus position, plus one. Mm -hmm. Right, so remember that the things are um, things are evaluated from left to right. So first thing I say, quantity plus position. And I say that plus one. So it's just because I uh, that's getting converted to a string then. So, two, three, four, five. Yeah, there we go. So, it, and finally checking one. Okay. So, I get the proper number if I say the quantity is the position plus one. Okay, so we've tested that we see that. And so let's see, what else do I need to do? So um, in terms of updating things, right? Um, well, what fields do I need to update? I need to update the price view definitely. So when you say, Hey, we need to we need to figure out what the new price is. So the price now would be the uh, item dot get product price times the quantity. Oh, okay. So I can't access that. That's where I need to mark things going on. Okay. So maybe new price float new new price. We've got the this is also the new quantity. So I've got the new quantity. The new price is the the price of the item times the new quantity. And then finally, I can say, well, let's show the new price. Why wasn't the price in quantity available? It should be within scope, right? Um, Lane 61. I mean, it's, it's about to change it. 
the problem is I couldn't change it because of scope. Um, scope gets weird because here I'm in a nested class. That's what makes things unusual. Because we're in a nested class, and effectively, this is an asynchronous method. This is called later. This is not called at the time when I write the code here. So that is at least seeming to update the, the price here. But you'll notice that it's not changing the price down there. You see that? It doesn't change these numbers. So I've got a basic problem in the fact that, um, you know, these are kind of disconnected where I can't refer to the spinner or the things in here. Um, I can't put this, this listener out back in the activity. I can put it here, but this activity does this this listener doesn't have access to everything. Everybody with with me there? So I've got a problem that I can't handle the event fully right now in either place. Did everybody see that? So what I need to use is a little trick. Um, I need to use a little trick to be able to get the, basically the handler to be where I need it to be. Um, I want to be able to handle this event back in card activity where I actually have access to these fields down there. And as well as access to the cart and such. Um, but right now that's not an option okay so what i'm going to do is under the adapter i'm going to create a new thing i create a new i'm going to say new java class i'm actually going to say that this is an interface and i'm going to call this the on um on quantity change listener on quantity change listener so oftentimes you'll find yourself in this place where you need to create your own your own listeners own custom listeners um, and so then that's like okay here's the you know here's how i want to hook it up here's the here's the code that i want to run when that happens so here I might say public, actually it doesn't need, if I remember it, it doesn't need to be public. So it's just going to be void on change. And so what I need is the cart item. And the new quantity. We need to know what the quantity is changing to. Everybody with me there? I'm not really getting what this is doing. Okay. It's not, not doing yet. anything yet. It's not doing anything yet. What it's going to enable me to do is move the logic from one place to another. Okay? Okay. Uh, you think we could take a short break in a bit? Yeah. Um, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we'll come back in, say, 20 minutes, come back at 2.25. Uh, I don't see the toast pop up. I can't figure out why. Mm -hmm. uh, what we got two on Yeah, no, it's fine. Any questions here? Anybody have any Yeah. 
Okay, so what we're trying to do here, right, we're trying to basically our, our end goal is to change where the logic is that handles the events um, so that, that that logic is not baked into the adapter, which shouldn't really know a lot about the business logic. Um, it's also a matter of so we can get that, that logic back to the activity. Okay, so, so that's our goal. Um, we have used um, a lot of these um, listeners um, throughout, you know, recent programming. You need to look at what we were just looking at. You can see there's the adapter view on item selected listener. There's the view on click listener, right? So both of those here are interfaces, right? They have no, um, they have no implementation that's provided. Right. And so in in second semester, right, you guys learn when you're learning C, you guys learned about interfaces. Correct. Yep. And then we forgot about them. Yeah. And to be honest, um, interfaces are a really important thing. Um, especially in the world of Java, um, because we don't really have lambdas per se, um, in the in the same sense that other modern programming languages do, um, interfaces exist in a way to kind of um, bridge this gap. And so, uh, an interface you, you probably learn well. It's similar to it's similar to an abstract class right so an abstract class can have abstract methods um, you may have learned that it was was similar to that right you may have learned that um, all of the methods um, in an interface have to be abstract right we can't give them an implementation like here we don't have we don't have curly braces giving them an implementation um, so those are kind of two details about the syntactic language uh, what you probably haven't seen up until this point is really why are they even there as a language feature and what are they actually used for um, and so what we're going to use it here for and give you kind of the um, the technical word is something called dependency inversion. That's what we're doing. We're doing dependency inversion. Okay. So what is a dependency? How would you define a dependency? Okay. That's one way to think about it. What's another definition? I might be wrong, but I think of libraries. Of libraries? Yeah. yeah. Oftentimes those are considered dependencies. Um, so the root term dependencies has a few things in it. It means that there's a connection between two different pieces. Um, that there's some relationship between the two different pieces. And specifically, if it's it's if there's a dependency there, we're saying that one thing basically cannot exist without the other. You know, it relies on the other thing. And so, you know, there's a dependency or a relationship between our activity and our adapter. Does that make sense? Um, so when I say dependency inversion, what I'm saying is I'm going to take the dependency as it exists and I'm going to flip it around. I'm going to make the dependency go the other direction. So that's what this interface is going to allow me to do is change the direction of the dependency. Okay. And so specifically what I mean by um, the dependency in this case um, is the relationship to the two classes in terms of like how you call functions. So, for instance, if I were to say in here, right, let's say I want to 
tell the activity to do something, right? So here I want to say, well, card activity Maybe I want to access the, you know, the subtotal dot set text. Obviously, this code is not going to work. But I, if I, if I've referenced the card activity, and I'm telling it what to do here. Now I've created a dependency where the adapter depends on the activity. Does that make sense? Because it's calling or accessing the fields in the other class. Um, so one of the important things we want to do is we want to make sure that our dependencies typically are one way. Um, we already have a dependency between the card activity and the card adapter because what are we doing here on, on line 54? We're constructing a new card adapter. Constructing an object, calling a method, that creates a dependency between the two things. And so what you want to avoid is things that are circular dependencies, where one thing depends on the other and the other thing depends on that. The other thing that happens as soon as you create a dependency between these two classes, so for instance, if the card adapter knows, this card adapter knows about the card activity or knows it's in the card um, activity, I can't anymore put it in any other activity. This is like the only activity where I can ever use this adapter. And so if I have an adapter that can only ever be used with one screen, that's not going to be very reusable. And I may likely end up creating a lot more adapters than I need to. Everybody with me there? So the adapter is kind of like a holding place in the middle. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, it kind of is. So what I want to do is I want to have, rather than saying like, let's let the card activity set the subtotal, that would be super bad because of the, the way that that is organized. I want to instead kind of be able to let the activity respond and do the right thing without making the adapter dependent on the activity. So that's why I'm, in, I'm gonna invert the dependency. So rather than the adapter depending on the activity, I'm going to make the, well, the adapters not, you know, it's going to be the other way where strictly the, the card activity depends on the card adapter. Okay. So I've created this on quantity change listener. That's my one for when the quantity changes. I'll make a note here, change direction of dependency. Um, so I'm going to create another um, interface here. So under adapter, I'm going to say new Java class. This is also going to be an interface. And so this is going to be on delete listener. And maybe I should call both of these um, based on the fact that they're a cart. So but I'm going to leave this as this. So on delete listener. And so this is going to be fired when we delete an item. So void on delete. So we've defined just these two interfaces. So I've got my on delete listener and my on quantity change listener. So this one's going to fire whenever the user changes what's in the dropdown, changes the quantity, or this one's going to be fired when we click the delete button. Okay. And so the the events we need um, the events we need are those. We need to know, you know, what is being deleted, the information that's there. We need to know that's being deleted. We need to know the quantities being changed. Okay. So internal to the, the card adapter, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back up to the top and I'm going to make a place for both of these listeners. So add another field, private on quantity change listener. We call this on quantity change. And this one's going to be private on delete listener on delete. Now, I could hook those up two different ways. One way is I could just take it in as the constructor arguments. So I could have the user pass in both of those listeners here um, to the constructor, or I could use, pass them as setters. Just to kind of keep the code brief today, I'm going to put it into here. So um, another argument into the adapter is it needs to be, it needs a, the on change listener and the on delete listener. So on quantity change listener, on quantity change, on delete listener, on delete. So we're just accepting both of these objects um, in the constructor, and then we're going to save them into our instance fields. Okay. Everybody got that part? I'm still typing, but I'll be able to catch up. Okay. Give me a minute. So are we not putting anything else inside the interfaces? No, that's it. The whole point of the interface is to keep them lightweight, is to keep them light. If I put more stuff in there, I would actually be breaking the whole thing I'm trying to do, which is the dependency inversion. The whole idea of the interfaces, the interfaces need to be as clean and simple as possible. Are we doing this not just to clear it up, but uh, uh, how can I say this? It just won't work if we do it, right? That's the original reason we're doing this. Um, it is possible to get it to work without this. Um, it is possible to get it to work without this. Um, but it would be a mess, and there would be a lot of problems with it. So it's possible without this. It is much easier and much cleaner to do it this way. How come we haven't encountered it to this point? Is there stuff that's in the other logic, say, like in Cart uh -huh. or elsewhere that would use interfaces? Because I'm not I, – I see what we're doing, mm -hmm. and I get the concept, but I wouldn't necessarily know to do this later. Right. So what I'm going to say is if you're using a recycler view and you have any events where you need to say, do something when this event occurs, this is the good strategy is to create a custom interface that represents that, that listener. Okay, okay. So you can do it for any listener, not just these. Um, yeah. So different listeners you might have on your different events that might happen with your recycler views, for instance. So in this case, these are the two things that can happen. We can change the quantity or we can delete the effort. And, and what I'm trying to do is the, the whole reason that I'm putting these interfaces in is because I'm trying to extract the logic out and put it somewhere else. Um, the reason you haven't seen a lot of this yet is partly just because you've been building small applications. That's part of the reason is you've just been building small applications. And so 
applications grow, you start to need more more tools in your tool bag to kind of um, make things work. Okay. All right. Next thing. So we've got those those hooked up. What I'm going to go down to here. We had a bunch of code actually in the. Um, we had a bunch of code here in these listeners, but I actually don't need most of that. So I'm going to simplify this down. So inside of on item selected, I'm going to say if um, on quantity change is not null, then I just want to say let's call on quantity change dot on change and we're just going to give it the item and the position plus one which is the new quantity and similarly in the delete button i'm going to say if there is an on delete if that's not null, then we're going to call on delete, on delete, and tell it the item that's being deleted. Can you see how that keeps both of these two methods very simple? Not much logic left in there. Because it allows me to move the logic to elsewhere. Maybe I'm not understanding, but like, mm -hmm. where's, where's, like you said, where's the logic? Like when it says on change, mm -hmm. all we have is just we're putting stuff in, but like, mm -hmm. nothing's. Because we haven't written that logic yet, which gotcha. is, we haven't written that logic yet. And that is the beauty of dependency inversion, is you can say, here, let let somebody else know about what's happening, and they'll figure out how to solve it, right? We don't know what's happening with on change. We haven't implemented it yet. We don't know what's happening with on delete. We haven't implemented it yet. It keeps the details of that out of the adapter, right? So the adapter no longer knows anything about what's happening when the when those things occur. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the whole point is, yeah, we haven't defined it yet. Okay. So everybody got those changes to the um, delete case and the on, on quantity change, both here and above? Yeah, I got my brackets screwed up somehow. Yeah. So what we need to do is go back to card activity. And remember in the constructor, we asked for both of these things. So I'm going to be passing these things to the constructor. I'm going to expand this a little bit, push that down, this cart there, because I want to have some more space to write this out. So the first argument to card adapter is this. Second argument is cart. Maybe I can move those there. Um, and then the third argument is a new on quantity change listener. There's the code that we were talking about. And I'm also going to say a new on delete listener. Right? So all the code necessary to deal with when the quantity changes or when an item is being deleted is now over here. Does everybody follow? You said it one more time. So all of the code, right? I've inverted the dependency, right? Mm -hmm. 
So the adapter doesn't need to know what happens if you change the quantity. It doesn't need to know what happens when you click the delete button. It okay. just says, call this listener over here. The listener will figure it out. And so the listener now we implement back in the, the card activity. So we've inverted the dependency. The dependency used to be like the code used to be over in the adapter. It's now back in the activity. So in terms of what I need to do in the on change, I'm actually going to use a method that we already have. So I'm going to say cart dots um, update update item. And so this is going to be item dot get product ID. And I'll pass in the new quantity. And in the delete, we'll say cart dot delete item or remove item item dot get product ID. We've already hooked up both of those methods, the update item and the remove item, to be able to um, to be able to update the the subtotal, the quantity, etc. Um, we also have code down here, which we've written, which is is how we're displaying those things. I'm actually going to break that off into a separate method so we can we can reuse it. So private void update totals so all of that logic i'm going to move over there and call update totals from here and i can call update totals in both of those two methods So what you should see is if we change the quantity, okay, this number's not changing right now. There's something we gotta fix. But you should see the totals now in the bottom changing as I change the quantities. And you should also see the you see the totals change when I delete. Can you do the delete action again? Mm -hmm. It did go to negative zero. That's something to fix. All right, somewhere um, when I click the delete, it like removes the the view. Um, okay. Not not the whole view, but the uh, the item itself, like the donut, the image, the price, and it keeps okay. the subtotal or Removes the subtotal, keeps tax in total. Removes the subtotal, keeps tax in total. Yeah, so subtotal zero, but tax is the 0.64. You might want to check that you're setting each of those three numbers correctly. Make sure you're setting it as, you know, subtotal, subtotal, tax, tax, total, total. Um, that's one possibility. The other thing is you said the it's when you do the delete, right? Yeah, it could be that in your cart that your calculations here are incorrect. Mr. Smith, can you go back to the cart adapter? Mm -hmm. Something's wrong with the on nothing selected. Yeah. I don't have any code in there, by the way. Neither do I, but it's thrown in there. So this is, Corey, have you compared your code with this to see if it's Yeah, better? I think I fixed it. I'm testing it now. Okay. Yeah, I got it, so. Okay. I think mine does what it's supposed to. You have spaces in all the wrong places. Spaces. Yeah. Can you just wait there? Can you just wait here? No. 
Curly braces and spaces. Okay. So is everybody kind of tracking with with this so far? So we we tell it the cart to go do the the math, and then we just update the totals according to the math in the cart. Okay. Yeah, mine still behaves differently than yours, though. Mine deletes the whole block of information, like with the picture, the the price, okay. and all that. This this disappears. Yeah. Um, I'm not entirely sure why that would be. Because um, right now it should just be state saying. Although, oh, well, that's interesting. I said change it to four. Mm. So if I delete it, yeah, and then change the quantity in that order, then it's disappearing for me. Yeah, I guess mine's just skipping the switching the spinner. I don't know. Yeah. So so here's the deal. Um, when any time we change the data that backs the um, adapter, we have to tell the adapter that there's been a change. Does that make sense? Anytime we change the data, we have to tell the adapter that there's been a change to that data. So in here, once we've, once we've done the update item or the delete item, I need to say adapter dot notify data set changed. Adapter notify data set changed. That tells it that there has been a change to the underlying data. So if I make that happen, then you can see that this price updates that as well as if I delete, it should go away. So that's the that's kind of the magic sauce when when you're working with things like this is oftentimes you have to tell the adapter that there's been a change to the data. Notify data set change. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anybody having any bugs at this point? Okay. Where's it crashing? Okay, so it's crashing back here, okay? So what that means is you didn't test one of your previous changes. Okay, that means one of the changes that we made previously, you didn't test. Um, so it's important to make sure you test as you're going along. So you go into main activity. Or actually, no, this would be the product, product list adapter, right? So look at first in the product list adapter, when you click on the item, what is it doing? Is it sending the product ID? Okay. Next question. When you go to the product detail activity, is it pulling out the product ID? 
do you still have this line of code in there? Okay. So I would then look at the log cap and see what happens. It's probably going to be around this point in the code. Is there any chance that your issues like ours yesterday where your P and product ID is capitalized? That would be if that could be it. If you Okay. Well look at look at log cap, see what it spits out. So you should get a you should get a stack trace, an error stack trace if it's crashing, that will tell you why it's crashing. So five Prio. So, any other issues, bugs? Um, why don't let me have more than more than? Or than what? Or than when what? Share it and try this. Um, go back to the main activity and just click the shopping cart. If you just click on the shopping cart, what does it does it bring you back to? They don't. Okay. Um, I'll probably troubleshoot that with with you offline then. Sure then. Uh, my guess is that it's is it somewhere in the um, probably the card adapter. It's probably related to this um, set of changes. I have a question about like a graphical. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is just Android Studio, but uh, if mm -hmm. you were to put another um, like if you were to put ice cream sandwich uh -huh. into the list. Uh -huh. When you scroll down, the spinner can be seen through the back of the bottom area. Mm. I don't know if that's just a Android bug or what, but yeah. Okay, so I think I know. I have some idea of what that could be. I think it's because of the spinner, and I think it's because the way we have this architected. Um. Oh, I know what it is. Yeah. So um, most things, it looks like the other things are being smart and they're not being allowed to draw outside of the recycler view, but that one is being allowed to, the spinner. Um, I believe that there is a flag we have to set um, on the recycler view to say that it can't be drawn outside. So activity cart and so good attributes here. Um, what happens if I say clip children?
So it's not that one. Um, I'll have to probably just look that one up on Stack Overflow. And, oh, wait. Well, there it is. Common attributes clip children. Well, what happens if I just check both of those is true? I checked one of them is true. What happens if I do both of them? Yeah, I'll have to look. I think that there is a, I'm going to guess that there is probably, probably a flag of, or some attribute that needs to be set on the recycler view to keep it from doing that. Corey. So I don't have the, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what, where, where that is. Okay. Um, and uh, it could be related to the fact that we have down here we're not drawing anything, and so this is empty space. And so maybe if there was something there, drawing like a background color, then it would go away. But what were you gonna say, Corey? I was also gonna say uh, you were t you're testing it out, and I saw mm -hmm. that you were able to add two donuts, but they didn't stack mm -hmm. in quantity. Yeah, is that so, because you scrolled down? Yeah, that's because I scrolled down. Because you see I have two different donuts. This is donut ID 1. This is donut ID 4. So I can add, I can safely add both of those because it, it's letting me add both of those because I have um, two IDs there, two different IDs. Gotcha. And I guess so, when I, for me, when I copied them over, I didn't change the IDs. I just kept them like the same like all yeah the so if i were to go to for instance like if i were to go to the product data source and just say the other two were like donut two ice cream sandwich two froyo two and you can see that the ids are, are four five and six um if i were to put those in there donut So you can see I can add donut and donut too. Gotcha. Um, just little things in terms of navigation. Um, it's still, if I click this, this up arrow, it's still always going to main activity. I, I would like to fix that. Um, and I also notice if, for instance, if I scroll down here and go to um, click on one of these, if I hit the back arrow, it stays scrolled where it was. You see that? But if I click the up nav, you notice how it scrolls all the way to the top of the list. Do you see that? Yeah. So that's oftentimes a usability problem if you're having very long lists like this, which is one of those reasons I say, well, realistically, the up nav should do the same thing as the back because the back doesn't have that problem. So what I want to do is go into both the, uh, the product detail activity and override that method as we, the on item selected, as we've done previously. So on item selected, if item dot get item ID is Android dot R dot home then we're going to say on back pressed and return true so i'm going to do this on product detail i'm also going to implement this in the cart here in a second so i say if that's the case now where are my curly braces mismatched Oh, because I don't have a curly brace here for the else. Okay, so 
if there, if you press home, then we're going to call on rec pressed. And same way with the card activity, stick that at the bottom. Oh, it's dot ID. That's what I'm missing in both of those. So that way, if I say scroll down here, press up, it's still in the same place. And if I hit back, it goes back to the product view instead. So that's kind of where that starts fitting in, into the, the bigger picture, making the back of the home same. How did you make your home? Uh, oh, never mind. I messed up. What were you saying, Paul? Uh, what other change did you make besides the home further up? Um, this? Uh, no, other than that. Wasn't there another change? I changed, I put that same code in a card activity and product detail activity. Yeah, same code, two classes. Um, and I probably want to hook up the place order button which does nothing right now. Um, and that's a that's obviously a pretty easy switch. So I'm just gonna go to um, the activity cart and say Android on click, just like we've done before. So Android on click. place order. Or on place order, either one. On place order. On place order, great. And so in here we'd say start activity, new intent, this, and order activity dot class. And just like I've changed on the other places in order activity, I also want to make sure, oh, well, that's already there. Cool, so I don't have to worry about that. So productivity. Let's go to cart, place order. Yeah, cool. Um, I do notice that the um, the order page actually says my cart because that used to be our cart page. So maybe in the manifest, I'll quickly change that to NSB. Although I think I've already extracted that string. Yep, yeah, so it's back in strings.xml. So strings.xml, activity order, where is it? Activity order, activity order. There it is, my cart. Okay. Place order. Yeah. So place order should take you here. Arrow should take you back. And so that's that's it for this project right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which method are you asking about?
Mm -hmm. So Sheridan will follow up with you in a minute. Anybody else got a problem? Okay, so that's that's that for today. Um, the rest of the time you can spend, you know, obviously submit this, upload it to Git, um, but the rest of the time you can work on your labs. Um, and so those those labs will just move move back a day, so they'll be due on Thursday. So to summarize what we've learned today, you know, some of the new things that you've seen, what are some of the things that we see here now in this example that we maybe haven't seen in, in some of the previous examples? There's at least two new things. Application. Okay, so we have the application class. Um, somebody else asked me, answer why, why is that relevant? Why would, why would we use the application class for? Okay. Globally, or, or another way to say it is accessible across multiple screens. What else? What else is new? There's the interfaces. Mm -hmm. So the interfaces, what was the purpose of that? That is to uh, build dependency inversion. Mm -hmm. Explain to me that term. What's what's the that what 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 did I say about that? What is dependency inversion? I think of it as a way to clean up the adapter. Okay. That's one way to explain it here. And to avoid circular dependencies. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's part of it. 